Pardon me. Okay, I'm actually giving a rather different talk to what I thought I'd be giving yesterday, which is quite a strange thing to have happen, and I'll show why as I, I go through the talk. So mainly what I'm doing is contrasting a neoclassical attempt to avoid reality through the model of loanable funds versus what actually happens, but also the money multiply, and how does that look in terms of a, a realistic look at how banking actually functions. And if you look at the mainstream, uh, it pretty much has a default position. You don't need to worry about credit. You know, forget about the banking sector. You can model the macro economy without including banks, except as frictions. And here's Ben Bernanke back in 2000, you know, Federal Reserve Chairman and all that jazz, saying this uh, lending is seen as a pure distribution that has no significant macroeconomic effects. You know, pardon me, oh, this front little magnifier software package of, of mine here. But a pure, let's say, see lending as a pure redistribution from from lenders to borrowers when debt's going up, from borrowers to lenders when debt's going down. And consequently, you look at all their models, there's no role for private banks for debt or money in any of their macro models. And this is me taking a little quote from one of my favourite people, Paul Krugman, on that front, saying that there's um, you know, abstract altogether from private banks. So they're now, you'll now be making a song and dance about including it after the financial crisis, but fundamentally it's left out. <clears throat> and the one of the intriguing things, of course, is the central banks are now standing up with the post-Keynesians and saying that banking actually matters and the way the banking functions is completely different to what you get taught in mainstream textbooks. So rather than saying banks lend out deposits, which is the mainstream perspective, <coughs> bank lending creates deposits. And the, even the Bundesbank has come out quite strongly on the same front. So it's rather a delight as an unorthodox economist, having spent many years quoting Basil, the late Basil Moore and Hyman Minsky and so on, of course, great thinkers. I can now quote great authorities on exactly the same point, which is marvellous. Now, the mainstream still tries to ignore this. So you have Krugman saying back in 2012 that uh, individual banks have to lend out the money they receive in deposits, to which the Bank of England says, basically, using an Australian expression here, bullshit. Uh, they don't lend out deposits. Bank lending creates deposits. Uh, now, the first reaction is to say, well, that has no particular impact. This is Krugman after that paper saying that... Uh, um, yes, they're more complicated than what we show in Economics 101, but they don't have an unlimited capacity to create money, and they're not outside the usual rules of economics, meaning supply and demand. And he talks about monetary realism becoming monetary mysticism. Um, now, since the crisis has hit, you are now getting neoclassical saying, well, OK, we didn't have the financial sector in our models before, now we have to have it. So we bring in as frictions. Of course, frictions are things that slow down your return to equilibrium. I think I'd much rather describe finance as a lubricant than a friction, but still. So this is, you, you go, this is a paper came out from the, or a whole series of papers from the Oxford Review of Economic Policy, and this was their conclusion. We need to have financial frictions in the model, relax the rational expectations, heterogeneous agents, more appropriate micro foundations, basically fine tune what we already have to include the financial sector in there. And that was the, the tweet that I had a, a bit of a battle with them when it came out early in, earlier in the year. Uh, but what I've also seen is this quite remarkable paper um, where these Swiss-based economists argue that you can get exactly the same results from the loanable funds model, the much simpler model, as they say, uh, versus bank creation of money, where there is no uncertainty and thus no bank default. Now, to me, anybody who says that's Therefore, we can use a simplification in those circumstances. They're talking about a simplification you shouldn't even touch because clearly the world, real world involves uncertainty and bank default. But what they argued was to say that uh, we can find places where you use the, the same results out of the two different approaches, where banks don't create money, where banks do create money. Uh, and they said it looks like all the problems come from the fact that there can be bank defaults. So if there are no bank defaults, you'll get exactly the same results out of the two models. Now, it's a, class, a typical neoclassical overlapping generations model, and leaving aside the insanity of saying, let's assume there are no bank defaults, uh, what I want to look at is the whole idea of saying, well, the only difference becomes because you can have defaults in one... If you have defaults in one situation, it's different to having defaults in the other. Therefore, uncertainty is the only thing that makes a difference between the two models. So what I want to show you is an alternative to their, their benchmarking. I'm going to show you two benchmark models of loanable funds versus endogenous money, but done not in the overlapping generations model and that usual sort of stuff, but my Minsky software. Has anybody here played with Minsky at all, by the way? Anyone? Okay, if you want to take a look at it, 
uh, just go to SourceForge, show you the website. SourceForge Minsky, and you can download it from there and install and play with it. So what I'm giving us a, a bit of a, a, a primer on using Minsky as well in this uh, in this talk as well. I'll bring that up so you can see the, the link there. So SourceForge Minsky. And it's it, it is part of a family of software packages that have existed for virtually half a century. So economists are that far behind the times because most of them aren't even aware that this sort of software even exists. And the packages I mentioned there, Vensim, Stella, Simulink, they all sell for about $2,000 a copy. So Minsky's a bit cheaper, it's free. Yeah. Um, not as well featured, but it has some things that they can't handle. Has anybody ever seen a system dynamics program before? Okay. Two, but most of you haven't. Okay, I'll just show you. You've heard of the what's called the the uh, butterfly effect for the weather. Okay, the flapping of a, a butterfly's wings can change. It, in Brazil, can change the temperature. Or give you a, a cyclone in um, in America. Um, this is. Let's make this a bit larger. This is the model from which that concept was derived, developed by a guy called Lorenz back in um, 1963. Pardon me, I'm stuffing up by pressing buttons here that I don't mean to press and getting operators being brought in here. So I'll just get those out of the way. So it's an incredibly simple model. What You can see there's a flow charts here. The flow charts actually define equations, which you can see over here. So there's three incredibly simple nonlinear differential equations. You have three constants, A, B, and C, three variables, X, Y, and Z. Very simple equations between uh, for each of the variables. You wouldn't expect anything complicated to come out of that and when you simulate it this is what you get so it's a dynamic system that has three unstable equilibria and aperiodic cycles and meteorologists and other sensible disciplines have been aware of this stuff for over half a century economists are still coming to grips with the very idea that you can have a stable cyclical system which is what this is because it, it, it will not break down the system will always remain within its um, parameter ranges, uh, even though it's hard, all the equilibria are unstable. So the whole idea of having to work in terms of equilibria is just nonsense. Um, and then with what these software packages let you do is design quite complex models using flowcharts to derive the equations rather than doing it by hand or in, in terms of um, uh, computer programming code, single lines of equations and brackets and all that stuff around. It's much, much more visible than it is with just the straight equation approach. I, I tend to flip between the two. I find the two work rather well together. So what Minsky adds is the capacity to develop equations for financial flows. And I tried, when I first was attempting to model my models of Minsky, the financial instability hypothesis rather than the software, I found I could never get the cabling right. I'd always make a mistake because you have to, any financial transaction has to affect at least two system states. If you're regardless of who the lender, the, bond, the lender is and the, and the borrower is, you've got to deduct the one amount from one account and increase it by the same amount on the other. The signs have to be right, etc., etc. And all these things you can make mistakes with with the flowchart software. But of course, accountants invented a perfect graphical user interface for accounting half a millennium ago called double entry bookkeeping. And then what I've done with Minsky is bring this into the system. So you have you can put banks into the Minsky models and the columns and rows in the banks give you bank accounts and transactions between bank accounts. So that's a that's the typical uh, view of the model. Here, here you, in the top row here, you type the bank accounts, whether they're assets, liabilities, or equity, and the rows here, you add the transactions between the accounts. And Minsky makes sure that every line pays the rule that assets minus liabilities minus equity equals zero. So that's, that's all it does. Now, what it then does after doing that if you, for example, here I've got reserves, loans, firms, workers, and banks as my five accounts, and I have lending by the uh, by the bank to the firms, firm paying wages, firm paying interest, workers consuming and bankers consuming, and the firm repaying the debt. Is that fairly straightforward? Trying to read that with flowcharts would be very, very complicated. Uh, so Minsky then generates a set of differential equations based on that for you. And you know that because all these rows sum to zero, you know that the accounting here is correct in the differential equations. And it can handle any level of complexity. So my favorite model there is done by another external 
PhD student of mine from Portugal, a guy called, um, um, I'm going to be suffering name for his right here, but his model is a model of the Portuguese economy. And it's more accurate than anything done by the central bank or the treasury so far. That's Pedro Pratas' model. So you then add the definition of the, the variables in here, things like the rate of interest. You do that using a flowchart layout. So the loans times the rate of interest is equal to the amount of interest being paid. And do our workers' wages, workers' bank accounts divided by the uh, rate at which their workers consume uh, becomes consumption by workers, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the basic logic behind it. So what I've done, I can model any financial system or any people's idea of what a financial system is using Minsky. So that's what I've done here. So what I did ages and ages ago is I took the model that you find in Eckertson and Krugman, where they built a so-called dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model of the finance sector, where you had a borrowing, a borrowing agent and a lending agent, and the level of loans could be arbitrarily constrained at some point and they then fed through the dynamics of that through a very, very simple neoclassical model. And all they had was the patient agent was the consumer goods producing agent, the impatient agent uh, who wanted to borrow money was the investing investment goods producing agent. The bank simply charged an introduction fee. I call that the Ashley Madison theory of banking. You know, rather than the bank actually doing anything to you, they introduce you to somebody else who wants to do something to you. Um, <coughs> And then after that, you have the firms, both firm sectors, by hiring workers, buying inputs from each other, and then the other social classes, workers and bankers, buying output of each other. And putting that as a Minsky table, or a godly, I call these godly tables after Win Godly, is the person who really showed the importance and the power of using double entry bookkeeping to maintain the valid validity of your financial transaction. So same thing as before, the consumer agent lends to the investing agent, investing agent repays, investing agent pays interest, consumer agent pays a fee to the bank, for, that's the Ashley Madison fee. Uh, the consumer sector hires workers, the investment sector hires workers, the consumer investment sector buys consumption goods, the, con the consumption sector buys investment goods, workers consume, bankers consume, and bankers invest. It's a very, very simple logic. And I have all the various um, variables in the system. I'll show you this in a moment. Let's bring that model up. So down here, I'll just actually zoom in and show some of these definitions down here. Down here, I've defined things like the rate of interest on debt multiplied by the level of debt is interest payments. That's what all those equations are doing. What I also have is the rate at which lending is occurring and repayments occurring and so on. And they're controlled by parameters. Those are the blue boxes. And you can vary the value of a parameter while the model runs to see what happens. So the two ones that I'm looking at, the key ones, are the rate of lending and the rate of repayment. And the smaller the number I give, the faster these things happen because the number basically says how many years does it take a particular entity to double so if I have seven there, it'll take seven years to double loans. If I had 10, it's 10 years to double loans. So the smaller number means a high rate of lending. Now, if I simulate this, this is the, the straight Eggertson-Krugman model, uh, but put in a genuine dynamic framework. What you can see is the growth rate pretty much stabilizes at zero. GDP is constant all the way through. Velocity of money is stabilized. And if I now increase the rate of lending, the growth rate actually dips. If I decrease the, decrease the rate of repayment, growth dips even more, and you have a dramatic increase in the debt to GDP ratio, which is what you're seeing down here on this chart. That's rising dramatically. Nothing much has happened to the growth rate, and your GDP is still flatlining at 200. And I could keep this going until such time as the debt ratio hits the sort of levels we know today, which are about one and a half to two and a half times GDP, there'd be no impact upon GDP in the process. And if I now uh, slow down lending dramatically and increase how fast repayment occurs, then the debt ratio plunges, the growth rate actually jumps up a bit for a while, but then it falls back down to zero again. So what I've got is dramatic changes on the financial side of the economy and nothing happening worth talking about on the macroeconomy. And that's, that's the perspective they've got. If you can use loanable funds, 
then lending has no impact on the amount of money in circulation. It might it changes how fast money turns over. It'll change the velocity of circulation because the lender and the borrower may have different rates of consumption, and that's what's going on, uh, causing those growth rate spikes here. But overall, not a great deal of change to velocity, no change to the stock of money, no change to nominal GDP. So that's their world. Now, if I simply go inside that model and say, well, in fact, it's not the, the, the investment sector does not borrow from the consumer sector, it borrows from the bank. The bank doesn't charge an introduction fee, it does obviously charges fees, but we can ignore fees for the meantime. So all I've got to do is drag the lending and repayment operations from the consumer sector to the from, from the from being from the consumer sector's account to the asset of the bank, ditto for the repayment, and make the interest payments to the bank rather than to the consumer sector. And all I've done is change the structure of the model that way. So I'll go in here in the consumer sector model. Make this a bit larger so you can see what I'm doing. I can now delete showing the debt as an asset of the consumer sector and delete the financial transactions that are shown here. Go across to the banking sector view of the economy. You can see it, like you can get multiple multiple views of the economy by having multiple agents and you look at what their accounts are doing and so on. Add in an extra column for the bank as a asset. See what liabilities, because I've still got the debt as a liability to the investment sector. Bring those operations across. Type in the remaining operations necessary to make the rose balance. Get rid of the bank fee. There's a couple more changes I need to make to be completely adequate, but I just want to show you how little I need to change before I get a completely different view of how the world operates. So now you go back and simulate it, you find you get a positive rate of growth. GDP is growing over time. The debt ratio is growing and the debts, debt and money are growing at the same time. If I increase the rate of lending, you get a boom in the economy. Did if I slow down the rate of repayment? Actually, you should start at a high level then I'll give a Actually, I'll go back, I'll, just, I'll stop it and start from the same values that I began the other simulation from. So I had seven years for the rate of repayment and nine years for the rate of, of uh, seven years for doubling of loans and nine years for halving of debt through repayment. Simulate that level, you get an obviously positive growth rate. GDP is changing over time. The money supply is growing because the extra debt is creating extra money. And if I speed up uh, lending, and slow down repayment, you get a more extreme boom. And then if you have a turnaround so people start to pay the debt off more rapidly and lending slows down, you have a financial crisis with the collapse in GDP. Now all I've got to do is say loanable funds is wrong, bank originated money and debt is correct. But that's how easy it is to show how wrong the mainstream view is on all this stuff. And you see this in the data as well. If you take a look at the um, economic data, you find a dramatic relationship between credit and aggregate demand. So what I want to explain intellectually is why is that relationship there? Because the neoclassical point of view is, is to say, and you'll see Krugman saying this all the time, one person's asset is another person's liability. Therefore, you can ignore the level of debt except during a liquidity trap. Okay. Well, I want to show how that's wrong. Okay. As soon as you say it's an asset and a liability, you've got to say whose asset and whose liability. And does change in an asset also change liabilities? So what I invented, I've still got to build this into the software. I'm calling it a Moore, a Moore table after Basil Moore. Uh, and that is a, a way of showing expenditure and income in a matrix where along the horizontal row you have expenditure on the off-diagonal elements, <coughs> pardon me, your income. So just to show you the table here, if you imagine you have, um, I've, I'm building a, a, a framework around this, this is just a, a matrix demonstration at the moment. But if I have sector A, let's call the sector one, sector two, and sector three, the vertical column is the income for those sectors, so is the, is the income for that sector, net income. The horizontal are expenditure by that sector. So sector one is spending A, dollars per year on sector two and B dollars per year on sector three. Therefore, those rows must sum to zero. 
down the diagonal, you have the negative of the, the negative of the diagonal is going to be expenditure. That's aggregate expenditure. The off diagonal is aggregate income. So there's expenditure by all the various agents. It necessarily is equal to income. So this is the identity of expenditure and income. But you can still so show a role for credit in that situation. So here's a model with no lending, and no 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 debt whatsoever. All transactions are financed out of existing money, and it's the rate of turnover that matters. And if you take a look at it, you've, what you've got is Milton Friedman's velocity of money times the stock of money, telling you how much monetary demand there is in the economy. Now, if you do the loanable funds, well, one sector is borrowing from another sector. So you've got a transfer of money along the diagonal. I call this, this is loanable funds. So you have sector uh, two lending to sector one. And sector one, sector two used to spend C and D on sector three. Now it's C and D minus L because it's lending that flow to the first agent. And the first agent then spends that on the third agent and pays interest to the second agent. For the money they've borrowed. So there's your loanable funds transfer of money and they cancel out. Then you have um, the expenditure impact also cancels out. Interest payments don't cancel out. Okay? So what you find is in loanable funds you get the quantity theory of money plus gross financial transactions. If I included interest payments deposit I'd get a positive deposit payments as well. It's not net, it's gross. Which again, something I didn't expect until I did the mathematics and then I found my expectation was wrong, but it actually strengthened the results in that sense. Now, the interesting one is, is if you have bank originated money and debt, as I'm now calling endogenous money. I think endogenous money is a very obscure term for anybody who's not doing a PhD in the topic. Bank originated money and debt, it's got a nice acronym and it's obvious what you're talking about even to people who aren't in the banking sector. Uh, in the in the in the academic world. So what I now have is off off this matrix. This this is the 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 bank creates uh, well, adds to its asset by lending money to you, and it adds to its liabilities as well. And then the borrower spends that money. So I'm not showing the the asset side of things here, but there's uh, the spending by the sector one that's doing the borrowing, spending it on sector three, and having to pay interest to the bank. And then if you sum up the diagonal and sum up the off-diagonal elements, you get exactly the same result. If I substitute in there that um, the L is the change in debt, so new credit is also equivalent to new debt, you get aggregate demand includes credit and aggregate income as well. So it's quite simple and logical to show that there would be an impact. And that's what the mainstream are missing out on by leaving credit out of their thinking. So... It matters because expenditure determines income and expenditure has two sources when you're looking at the domestic world. You can have the turnover of existing money, which is the basic Milton Friedman logic. You also have credit money created by the banking sector. So the new credit money is identical to new debt because new debt creates new credit money. That's then spent into the economy and you're going to be mainly you're now causing asset price inflation, of course. So credit is not a pure redistribution. And it has so highly significant macro effects, which the mainstream is still ignoring. And I find it incredibly frustrating a decade after the event, they're still ignoring this obvious data. Uh, and it's when you look at the, the, the logic uh, using the monetary system that I use and that Wynne Godley uh, developed, um, then you get a very, very different world. So my, back then I had to compare my Minsky model versus the the one that Farr and Garbage put in that typical neoclassical paper. There is no difference in uncertainty between my loanable funds model and my endogenous money. The uncertainty applies to both of them. There's no risk because there's no stochastic elements between the two, but there's a dramatically different outcome. So credit creation expands and contracts aggregate demand in a world of endogenous money, bank originated money and debt. Um, when you have loanable funds, you don't have that being created. You don't get an addition to or a subtraction from demand from credit. So they're still ignoring the real world in a very dramatic way. And what they're ignoring, and this is what I find so frustrating, I've been graphing this stuff for over 10 years now. That's the correlation of unemployment to credit in America since 1990. A 0 .8, minus 0.89 correlation. Spain, minus 0.94. 
This is how powerful the data is that they're ignoring. Okay? And it's just, to me, it's just beyond ridiculous that they're to, still attempting to ignore this because their beliefs are more important to them than the real, realism of their models. Now, one thing, this is the new part that I didn't expect the result I got that I did yesterday. So I'll be winging this a bit. We'll see how we go. Uh, the money multiplier, if you think about it, it's one of the, the simplest models in economics. And the first thing that gives any school student or university student who confronts it an aha moment, I didn't know that. You know? Uh, so what you have is, pardon me, I've got the analysis on the wrong side here. You have the idea of somebody deposits $100 at the, the Acme Bank. Uh, they hang on to $10 as reserves and loan out 90 and then the person who borrowed that money from the Acme Bank goes and deposits at Bank B, and the deposit is 90 Bank hangs on to 9 lends at 81 yada, yada, yada. So after the first three of those iterations, you get $271 deposited out of the 100 initially, 243 of loans, $27 worth of, of, uh, of reserves. Now... This has been rejected by post-Keynesians and by the central banks as unrealistic <coughs> for a range of reasons. So for the first thing, it violates the fundamental law of accounting. That holds you that assets minus liabilities minus equity must equal zero. Um, what is being argued here, and I agreed with this until yesterday, I might add, is that, no, I didn't, this one I knew there was an error in, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. This says, you, if you imagine you can lend from reserves, you're necessarily violating the law of accounting because if assets go down, liabilities have to fall as well. So you can't lend from your assets to your liabilities by deducting from your assets. It's actually destroying money, not creating it. So that was the, one of the first critiques. And they also said it doesn't explain money creation. And this is the part I agreed with until yesterday. So that if you look at what's actually going on, you're simply redistributing existing money. You're not creating more money. So I thought I'd check this out by putting it together in a Minsky model. Now, the first thing is it's definitely true that lending out deposits is not what banks do. Okay, so that's the criticism is definitely correct on that front. Does it violate the fundamental law of accounting? Well, it does if you try to model lending from reserves to deposit accounts. That will give you an accounting error. But that's, I think, the sort of back of the brain thinking that neoclassicals have about what's going on. It doesn't violate that law if and only if you pretend that all bank loans are in cash only. Now, who's got a loan from the bank where they gave you a, you know, you're buying a property in Leicester, so they gave you 150,000 quid in 1,500, $100, pound notes. Anybody? Nobody. Well, okay. Um, but if you, if you do pretend that banks actually give you cash when you go to the bank, then you can make this fit the fundamental law of accounting. So it's what I call a complicating assumption. Okay, if you want to hang on to your theory, you've got to make a complicating assumption about the real world. Does it explain money creation? Well, again, it's much more complicated what actually happens because in the real world, we know that loans create deposits and so assets rise and liabilities rise at the same time. And it's just one line to show that's actually happening. But you can still explain money creation using it. That's what I didn't expect would happen. That was a surprise in putting this model together. So if you think about the first three stages in the money multiplier model, the first is depositor A puts some initial amount of money into bank X. Bank X lends to borrower B, and the bank retains the reserve ratio times the initial amount as reserves, lends out the remainder to borrower B, and borrower B then deposits one minus the reserve ratio times the initial amount in bank Y, and on you go. That's the basic logic. Well, I thought I can put this together in a Minsky model. Now, first of all, to show why you can't do what I think economists think is done, lend from reserves, because if I have a minus loans here, so I'm taking money out of a reserve account, and I put a plus over here to increase the amount of deposit account, Minsky says I've made an accounting error. Quite simple to show that. You've got to have, this has to sum to zero for every line. It doesn't in this particular case because assets are negative, minus liabilities is also negative. Rather than getting a zero here, you get minus two times the initial loan. You've got an error. So that side is wrong. But you can record the fallen reserves as a loan if you instantly increase the loans by the amount you reduce the reserves by. 
So if I just pull that entry over here and say the reserves go down, the loans go up, then I get the accounting is correct. Now the only way that can happen is if the borrower takes money out in cash. Okay? Because if you look at the, the bank's view of the cash loan, it looks like this. Um, first of all, Tom deposits in, uh, in Bank A, and then Bank A lends to Dick. So there's minus in the reserves, plus on the loans. From the borrower's point of view, they're seeing themselves, they've got a, the assets have gone up, they've got their borrowed money from the bank, they've got cash, okay? Their liabilities have gone up by exactly as much. But money's been created because what you've now got is cash, okay? You've gone to the bank, you've got a cash loan. So you've got a debt to the bank because they gave you the cash, the money you've got is cash, and you then redeposit that back in another bank, and on goes the whole cycle. So putting that together in Minsky, I, I'll show you that in a moment, I get the money multiplier working dynamically, but I've got to, it isn't the only thing I've got to do. I've also got to pretend that all these things happen sequentially. So first of all, what depositor A goes to the bank and deposits the money. Then the bank lends out the money. Then the next depositor. If I overlap them in any way, it almost disappears. Not quite, but it almost disappears. Now, if you think about the real world, people are borrowing money, lending money, repaying money, depositing money all the time asynchronously. So the right framework for modelling that is continuous time. Things will overlap and change in their dynamics. Not asynchronous discrete time. But if I use asynchronous discrete time, I get the neoclassical outcome. If I don't do that, I don't get the neoclassical outcome. So I've got to have two complicating assumptions. I have to assume that banks lend only in cash and that all loans happen in sequ sequence with each other, loans and deposits. So there's no time overlap. Then I'll get the neoclassical system. So this is what a model looks like, and I'll bring it up and show you. The structure is quite simple. It might look complicated there, but in each case I have a bank here. This is bank A, and I have bank A, B, and C, and Tom, Dick, and Harry as my three agents in the in this in the system. So Dick, uh, Tom turns up first of all and deposits uh, money in the bank. So the cash that Tom's got, which would be a government grant of cash or whatever else, ends up as the reserves of the bank and equal to the deposit by Tom. And then Bank A lends to Dick. And what happens from Dick's point of view is Dick now has this loan, which has given them cash, so the assets have risen, equal to the debt, and they then deposit that uh, in the next bank, which is Bank C, and the whole thing cycles around. And then what I've got over here, and this looks quite complicated, but it's basically logic, here saying between time period zero and time period one, the amount of money that's injected into the economy, which in this case is 100 pounds, is paid into the paid into the banking system. And then when time was t equal to one, that flow stops. So if I simulate this, and then, then what happens is after that happens, the bank then lends the money that's been injected out while hanging on to the reserve ratio for, for its, its own reserves, lends that to the second agent, and then the second agent deposits, and the second bank lends out, and the third agent deposits, and the third bank lends out. I'm just doing three here, but that's enough to give you the idea of the dynamics. And you simulate it, and what's going at this stage is reserves are going up and cash is going down. Once the loan starts, you get money creation over here. Then you get the next stage of deposits, and the money creation stops. Then money loan goes out, more money creation, depositing, and the money creation. You get this step process. So over time, each of those numbers corresponds to the neoclassical spreadsheet model. This is what's going on. The accounting is all correct. When you take a look at all the uh, double entry bookkeeping tables, all the assets minus liabilities minus equity columns sum to zero. So you do get money creation, okay? But only in this, it only matches the neoclassical vision when you have it happening in discrete time. If I go to continuous time, and I have a very fast rate of re rate of depositing going on here. You can see the reserves and the cash changing over time. You can now just see that the level of money has grown above the base level there. 
Uh, simulation will be running for five years at the moment, and it'll take 35 years for the amount of money in the economy to double. Rather than the money multiplier model leaves out the whole question of time, but it appears to be a very fast iterative process, you know, very fast increase in money. A again, this is an artifact of the, the model itself. It's not anything like the real world. So it'll take 35 years to get to the stage where the amount of money doubles in the economy. So you do get money creation out of the money multiplier model, but you have to make two complicating assumptions to get the result that it actually works, both of which you know are false. So I might actually have a bit of a chat about that part of the paper, because that's pretty much the main new material that I've covered here. Any reactions? What's the role in Wendorf's simulation? I mean, all these moving elements here, that's Minsky. So Minsky... Is it one year window? Pardon? Oh, no, no, no discrete time. I'm a complete critic of discrete time modelling. I only do continuous time modelling. In fact, I could have included the capacity to do discrete time modelling in Minsky, and I refused, because I think it's an extremely bad habit I want to wean economists off. Okay? There's no such thing as discrete time in the real world unless you're talking about things like populations of red crabs off Christmas Island, because they all breed on the same day as a survival tactic against being eaten by predators. Um, nobody, you don't consume at exactly the same instant everybody else consumes. Firms don't invest at the same instant. But that's what's the abstraction of discrete time forces that artificial vision on reality. And a large part of the dynamics you get out of those models are the project of the wrong type of modeling framework. That's what I've actually illustrated in this case around. Discrete time modeling gives you a very different result to the modeling the same process in continuous time. Even though the two models are shown there are both fictions, there's an enormous difference between the two. So I literally, the, the, window, the, window, the time window is an adjustable thing using what's called the runge cutter algorithm. Anybody heard of that? Or if you heard of runge cutter? Yeah. So using the runge cutter algorithm, which is an adjustable window, the minimum step size is about, I think in that particular simulation, 0 0.01 of a year. Yeah, so three days is the honest answer to your question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. When the, 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 the double entry error yep. of the loan creation, if, if the loan wasn't uh, made out in cash, yeah. isn't, if that loan itself is deposited in the same bank, it, what, what you reduce in reserves immediately increases the reserves. It well. cancels out. Yeah. yeah. If you actually try to model in the one bank or a banking system at the aggregate level, it cancels out. The only way you can actually have this working as a so-called model is to have people taking the literally taking the cash out of the bank when they borrow money. Mm. Yeah, so you, you can do it, but you've got to distort reality. But the thing is, you're not actually lending out of reserves. Well, you can. You lend out of reserves if you take the cash out, but if you immediately deposit back in, your reserves go up again. Exactly, oh. exactly. It cancels out. It's, it's the one at the aggregate level of the banking sector. Mm. The, the reserves are playing no role. That's part of what I want to develop on now as well, to say, if you bring it all together, all the action on reserves disappears. And it's just loans create deposits. Mm -hmm. So it's a more sophisticated put down of the model than I thought I'd have to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, this is probably a naive question, because I'm coming from a different background. So can, can, can well, they, they normally lead to more sensible questions than what economists <laughs> ask. <laughs> I am an accountant. <laughs> is, is that a confession? No. That's my profession, yes, which went to five years. Oh, no, is that a confession, I said? Oh, that's a confession. Old confession. Have you seen the old... It's my confession. It's like, you know, I've lost all this. Yeah, yeah. What I'm intrigued with is, yes, I can see the double entry system. I can see it working. And I can see the effects of it. And I can see that when you introduce credit, it gets more complicated. Yeah. Because credit, you can spend that money two or three times while actually negotiating that loan. Because mm. as you say, you don't take all the loan out of the bank. Mm. It, it's moving, but it's not necessarily moving it will, over the Not an entire lump, period. it's a flow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At the end of the 25 year period, you'll get the whole of the loan. But mm. in the meantime, that loan's being utilised elsewhere. Yeah. Um, wasn't there an issue, I mean, I, I'm just intrigued of how the model would have reacted in 2007, 2008, when the banks at that point said, 
we want the money now. Mm -hmm. Which is where many banks then had to look at their reserves and see whether they could afford to repay huge amounts of stuff because they already got frightened of where the credit was being done. Mm. Is that something that you could include yeah, in this easily. model? Or, or, and, and have you done so and seen some dramatic results? Pardon, sorry? What have the results been? Or, or well, what you get is pretty much what happened in the real world. There was a yeah. period where credit was growing at, in America's case, credit was equivalent every year to 16% of GDP, 15%, and then it fell to minus 6%. Mm -hmm. So you went to have effectively 21% of GDP swing around and aggregate demand in the economy in two years. Mm -hmm. That's what caused the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And when you include it with the double entry bookkeeping side of things as well, I haven't done this specifically. It'd actually be an interesting PhD topic to do it. Uh, what I've done is simply I've covered the aggregate demand effect of this huge plunge in demand when you go from positive credit to negative credit. But of course, at the banking sector level as well, working with multiple banks, some of those banks, the asset values of those banks, de depended upon the price of financial assets. When the price of financial assets plunged, their assets declined as well, their liabilities were still the same, equity turned negative. And the classic there was Hank Paulson. I think he got a call from Goldman Sachs. This is when Hank Paulson was Treasury Secretary. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, look, you've got to do something. We're about to go bankrupt. And Hank Paulson, this is in his book, On the Brink, said, oh, how long have you got? You know what the answer was? About three hours. Okay? So that's how fast this can... Because the plunging value of the assets, they've got to record against their liabilities. Bang, they're approaching zero. Margin Call is a great movie on that front too, by the way, for those who don't have the accounting background. Quite fascinating. Well, the other thing that's hard to be interested in is probably a little bit too soon, but to see the cycle of this over the last, say, since the 1930s onwards, to see whether there's a pattern of these financial crises there is. developing. There is. Because there will be a mathematical formula somewhere of the number of years. You want to see it? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Or am I boring everybody else? <laughs> no, no, no. Um, this uh, the, the huge. Thing, I'm trying to change a whole lot in economics, but one is the obsession about micro foundations. Mm. I believe you've got to drive micro from macro, but they can't see any other way to start. And this is what Olivia Blanchard says here. You know, where else do you start from? You start from macro, because micro we know from. This is some of the stuff I cover in debunking economics. Neoclassical economists, much to their chagrin, proved decades ago, that you can't derive macro from micro. In fact, you can't even derive micro from micro because the model they teach you of a utility-maximising individual and profit-maximising firm, leaving aside the firm side of things, which is another can of worms, with the individuals, you can derive a downward-sloping curve for an individual in isolation. As soon as you say there's more than one individual and more than one market and people have different income sources and commodities have different characteristics, as soon as you do that, the demand curve you can derive by aggregating isolated individuals in the market economy can have any shape at all that you can draw using a polynomial. There's no proof whatsoever of a downward sloping demand curve. And the way they get a proof of the downward sloping demand curve is to assume all, com all consumers are the same and all commodities are the same, which abolishes the whole idea of relative prices. So they have total can of worms they're sitting on top of. This is part of the extract from Sun and Shine's statement of the of the hypothesis some decades ago now, getting back to uh, 25 years ago. Um, but you can actually derive macro from macro. And this is, a, this is what I did back in 1992 when I built my Minsky model. I didn't realise I was doing it in this fashion. I derived in a, in a sequential a sequence, of, a causal sequence. But I've since realised that what I actually effectively did was take three definitions of undisputable macroeconomic elements, wages share of GDP, which is income distribution, employment rate, which is the level of economic activity, and debt to GDP ratio, which is the level of finance in the economy. Dry, differentiate those with respect to time, and you get three undeniably true statements, which are, in mathematical terms, that's what they look like. The first one says that employment will rise if the growth rate exceeds the sum of population and labour productivity change. That's simply re restating the, the definition of the employment rate in continuous time terms. Wages share of GDP will rise if wages rise faster than labour productivity. 
and the debt ratio will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. Those are three entirely true statements, not even a model yet. So you make them into a model by bringing in the simplest relationships you can initially. So I have a simple linear relationship between capital and output, linear rate of depreciation, gross investment um, coming from a investment function, wages change coming from a linear Phillips curve. Put those all together and debt financing investment and constant growth in population and labour tech, labour uh, productivity and what you get is this system and when you model that system you get a system which has got its own two unstable equilibria or one stable one unstable equilibria and I'll simulate it and show you its behaviour so those are those three definitions done in Minsky now. If I bring up the equations, those are exactly the equations I showed you a moment ago. Okay. Very, very simple model. Three variables and eight parameters. And two behavioural relationships. And if I simulate this with a low level... Hang on, I've got a... That, that bloody toolbox is so easy to click on a tool unintentionally. I'll just reduce the slope of the investment function here. At a level when I know it's stable. Oh, hang on. Oh, yeah, it's going to be stable. Slowly. So you get an economy that stabilises to an equilibrium rate of growth, equilibrium level of employment, equilibrium wages share. I won't. It'll, it'll get there. I won't, won't, won't keep on going to. I want to show the other effect. If you have a higher rate of desire by, to invest by capitalists, then you get what looks like a great moderation, followed by a great recession. Okay. So that's that's the simplified version of the model that I built back in 1992 that didn't just predict the crisis of the 2008, it predicted there'd be a moderation beforehand. And that's what we saw. It also shows a declining amount of income going to workers, so rising level of inequality. So it's ridiculous how deep those equations are on an incredibly simple foundation. And that's why I'm saying neoclassical economics works extremely hard to get to results that are totally wrong and boring. Okay? It is far too... People think it's simplifying. Their models are incredibly complicated. And they're all to reach a result to say capitalism is nice and stable and none of these things ever happen, which happen all the time in the real world. So it actually is quite simple, ridiculous thing, to build those particular models. Yeah? Can I ask just a very quick question? So um, when we, one of the times we met up with the Bank of England, and they were right. doing some of this type of modelling, yeah. and without wishing to invent terms, it's a kind of meso it's not micro, it's not macro. It's meso, effectively. Meso. They're trying yeah. to model each sector. They're trying to estimate, as I understood it, mm. to estimate the relationships, the causality, the lacks, and so on. Is, and then uh, there was another group, Stephen Kinsella, who were doing the same thing with the bank. Sort of, like, yeah. Lots of other groups. So in, your, in your experience, is that process continuing, or is that yeah, now... It's, it's continuing, but the neoclassicals are fighting back. Right. So, like, you, you, you have the Bank of England pushing what they call the One Bank Research Agenda. They've got a lot of physicists inside there they're doing complex systems modelling. They're doing neural network modelling and things of that nature. Yeah. So they're pushing forward. But the mainstream is like the Oxford Review of Economic Policy, for example, is saying, let's go back and tweak our DSGE models. That's what they want to do. Let's add financial frictions. So, so where would you say, from what you know, that... Which, who, who's the most enlightened, in your view, of the modelling groups within within the official banks? And oh, the Bank of England, Bank definitely. Of uh, the, the, the most worthwhile research is taking place there. So a, a lot of time for the bank, the bank staff and, and their research agenda. And they're quite open. They come up with good stuff all the time. So there's a quite a lot of positive work coming out of the Bank of England. Uh, the Bundesbank gave me an incredible surprise when they came out in favour of bank-originated money and debt as being the real-world system. 
So I, I don't know how much has actually happened there, but the Bundesbank appears to be a point of progress as well. The Bank of Norway, those are three that I know for sure, and various banks in South America. So it seems to be the central banks that are doing the interesting work now because the mainstream academics want to go back to believing what they've always believed, whereas the central banks, I think, were on the firing line. They, they, took, they, they convinced the politicians that we can do it better than you can. And then a financial crisis occurs, and who cops the crap for it? The politicians. What do they do when they get when the, when the press goes away and they stop smiling? They bash the shit out of the economist who told them it was all going to work out well. So in that sense, the, the, the political nexus with central banks means that the, the politicians have imposed... You say, I want something I'm not going to be embarrassed by in two years' time when I'm still in office, when I'm campaigning for the next election. I don't want you bastards stuffing up my electoral capabilities. So in that sense, that political pressure, even though they talk about central bank independence, that political pressure means that the effort to innovate and be more realistic is stronger in central banks and not even treasuries than it is in academic departments. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're, we're over time, so I think probably... Thank you very much, Steve. Yeah. Thank so much for coming. Welcome. Okay.